Now, let's talk about an alternate key. Okay, see, these are probably some terms that uh, not everybody has had a lot of exposure to. An alternate key is often used with a surrogate key. Okay, so you've got a surrogate key that's the primary key. You've got that identity column, that's your primary key. But you can also put in an alternate key with this, and this is a column or a set of columns that are naturally unique. Now, wait a minute, Scott. <laughs> you were just talking about a natural key, and then you switched to a surrogate key, and now you're telling me that an alternate key is a surrogate key, and then you also have a natural key? Yeah, that's exactly the way it is. You don't always, let me go back to that. I thought, sorry, I thought there was something else there. With an alternate key, and I don't want to get into the idea of width and index size and the size of your tables here. When you have a naturally occurring unique set. Many times that spans many columns. You remember that idea that I said a social security number earlier? So in the US, I don't know if you know what social security numbers are. Those of you in the US certainly do, uh, but I won't presume that anybody else does. Uh, so a social security number is a government generated number and it's theoretically going to be unique. Okay, well that's great if you're a small company, you've got 100 employees, and you don't have to really worry about there being any clash. But if you are a hospital and you're dealing particularly with the elderly, uh, people that were born in the 20s, the 1910s, the 1930s, 1940s, there were many cases of duplicate social security numbers. We didn't store everything in computers then. So there were many duplicates that were generated back then. And so as a hospital, you're probably going to, at some point in the next 20 or 30 years, encounter duplicate Social Security numbers. And you have to plan for that kind of thing. So you can't make the Social Security number alone the primary key. You've got to have some other naturally occurring value that is going to add to the uniqueness. For example, let's say that it's one in five million patients born in the 1940s decades are going to have a duplicate. I, I'm making that number up. I, I doubt it's that high, but let's just say it is, okay? So what's the likelihood then, if one in five million have duplicate Social Security numbers, what's the likelihood that two people with the same Social Security number have the same first name, last name, and birth date, right? That probably goes down into the one in one billion, one in 500 million, and at that point you might feel pretty comfortable. But the problem is now you need four columns to uniquely identify one particular patient. You have to say, you know, select from my table where um, the social security number is this, and first name equal that, and last name equals this, and birth date equals that for every patient you ever go after, if you make a natural key. So we generally don't want to have to do that. What we will usually do to make our queries more efficient and easier, we will put in that surrogate key, and then when we create an alternate key that still guarantees that uniqueness. So we'll create those four columns as a unique constraint so that no one could add another duplicate of those four columns to the table but that's not the primary key. I know that was really long-winded. I know that went a long time. I'm sorry, but it's important to understand what an alternate key is and why it's so important to the SQL world. Okay, let's switch gears here. Let's talk now about the foreign key. The foreign key is a referential constraint. Uh, this is between how many tables? Two. Okay, you don't have three table or five table foreign keys. This is just two tables and it enforces data integrity. Now, what I mean by that, you've got a parent table, okay, and you've got a child table. Okay. The idea of the foreign key, oops, sorry, I did it again. The idea of the foreign key is that you cannot insert rows at the child that would be orphans because they had no parents. Let me write that down in maybe a better uh, way to think about that. The bottom line,
of working with foreign keys no orphaned child records. That's what data integrity, referential integrity means. There are no orphan child records. In other words, there are no children who do not have parents. Now we'll have to get into some code examples to deal with that a little deeper in uh, the next couple of chapters. We won't get to that really until our chapter on joins. But just understand, parents and child, no orphan child records, that's all I need you to remember right now. Now, with your foreign keys, you can make them required. You can make them optional. We're going to cover that again a little bit later. Um, when you're designing your primary keys and foreign keys, these can be done on a single column, like Social Security number, or they can be on multiple columns, like Social Security number, first name, last name, and birth date. Okay? When they are built on multiple columns, we call that a composite key. <laughs> So a primary can be can be a composite key. It's just simply a generic term that means it's built on multiple columns. Okay. Whew, wipe your head. We're out of that one right there. So let's now talk about some of the history of SQL. Let's talk about ISO, ANSI, uh, ANSI 92, SQL 2, and figure out what all those are and what we're going to focus on in this course.